the thing about Fraser Crane today versus uh, yesterday is, is, I mean, well, yesteryear, uh, is he's more comfortable in his own skin. He's, he's not jaded. Knock it off, Bugsy. <laughs> he is more traveled, more settled in who he is. Hey, uh, do we have the Invisible Man? Right here. <laughs> more open to the kindnesses that he can actually give and receive. One thought, mm -hmm. seek help. <laughs> but lately he's been on a bit of a dry spell. <laughs> you don't have any manners, do you? <laughs> then perhaps what you need <laughs> is an elegant lesson. <laughs> the things about Fraser that are interesting are he's always been an optimist. He has always been an innocent in many ways. And so that quality remains about him. You're taking Frederick to Williamsburg? Ooh. Ooh. It's a wonderful vacation spot. We're going to dip candles and tan leather, churn butter. Hey, Frederick Crane, you just finished the first grade. What are you going to do now? I'm going to Butterworld. <laughs> hey, baby, I hear the blues are calling. Toss salads and scrambled eggs. My first directing episode, Moondance, was simply a matter of time for me. I had been planning to be a director or at least to direct some of the shows on Frasier, when I felt the time was right. And come the third season, it finally was right. I'd been on television for 12 years, and I thought that if I didn't step into the arena at that point, then I was just kind of wasting my time. So I felt always that I never wanted to take on the other mantle or you know wear the other hat as well as act in the show until I was ready to do both efficiently. And so that's why it took so long. But uh, once that happened, I, I felt very comfortable in that seat. Just for tonight, could you call me Niles? You know, when I was in school, I knew a boy named Niles, and I called him Niley. <laughs> Just for tonight, could you call me Niles? It was his first time directing, but boy, you wouldn't have known it, because he, uh, we expected he would be good with actors, because he's a good actor. And, uh, but he was so visually creative. I remember one of the first things he said was, I need to have an overhead camera for this, for the dancing shots. And I don't know, if I were directing for the first time, I'm not sure I'd be thinking of overhead cameras and stuff like that. I'd be thinking, you know, maybe I'd just take my handheld video and do it myself. He was amazing and, and very fast. And of course, all his years of doing this on Cheers and everything, I'm sure he absorbed a lot. Make sure that you trust your cameraman. That was one of the things I learned from Burroughs. And other than that, my own blueprint for directing any show is make sure you're just telling the story. Don't get too directory. You know, don't see the fingerprints. Don't see your hands on it. Hi, everyone, I'm home. Tell the story. Get out of the way. Make sure that, make sure they can't spot you in, in the middle of the story as doing some sort of directorial trick to something. The thing that most surprised me, actually, was that I was better at seeing what the cameras were doing from the stage than behind the camera, because I'm just more comfortable out in front of them. But I like that feeling. So I like being in the middle of the action and knowing what the camera's doing at the same time. I like organizing where I think the shots are and, and kind of editing the show in my head as I shoot it. I, I like the mental game of it. And so I'm the kind of guy that likes stress or I thrive on it. And when I add another level to, to my tasks, I feel more rewarded, I guess. When I'm a little bit out of my depth, I feel as though I'm frankly rising to a challenge. Dad, stop. I've just had the most perfect six days with my son and I'm still on vacation until 10 a.m. tomorrow. But it's about but, 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 but. Dad, I do not care to know how hard Daphne made you exercise, or about the boring foreign film Niles made you sit through, or the progress of Eddie's on-again, off-again romance with the Ottoman. I'm brutal when I direct you myself. I, I constantly harass the actor. I, <laughs> I beat him down. It's, it's, I'm, I'm, I'm a fairly honest guy. I think I know what's funny. I think I know what works for the character. So I, I just, I'm, I'm quite comfortable now doing both at the same time. Moondance was a really fun episode to do for a couple of reasons. One, it was uh, the first episode that we've ever done where all of the writers wrote the script. They each, it was put together under emergency circumstances. And so each of the writers uh, took a scene and wrote it. Anyway, Niles, if there's anything we can do to cheer you up, just let us know. Perhaps a murder-suicide pact. <laughs> the writers won an Emmy for the episode, which was kind of wonderful because, you know, people talk a lot about the ensemble of actors, but clearly we had a great ensemble of writers as well because 
that was one where they all contributed and, uh, and they all got the prize. They weren't very nice. You? Well, everyone in our set seems to have this idea that while Maris is out living the high life, I'm sitting at home crushed and lonely. Oh, never mind those gossipy twits. Tonight, you're all mine. Now, take me in your arms, Niles, and let the music carry us away. Thank you. We'll be back in ten minutes. Prior to Moondance, I don't think I did know how to tango. We had a choreographer come in and show me. Uh, Jane knew how to do everything, as she always has, because she was a trained dancer. But they, I was very remedial before that show. Excuse me. She's been missing for three days, and you're just panic-stricken now? Well, I only just realized it. The last two nights, I, I knocked on Maris's bedroom door to wish her good night, and I was greeted with a chilly silence, so naturally I assumed everything was status quo. We never have seen Maris, and I wasn't disappointed by that. I think that what became fun about Maris was the challenge for the writers to come up with more and more horrifying and ridiculous details about her, and uh, so we just looked forward to seeing what they'd, what they'd cooked up, not so much who they might cast. There is no greater friend of the working man than my own Maris. Mm. Remember when our stable boy Joaquin's appendix burst? She had him driven back to the border at her own personal expense. The interesting thing for me about the separation storyline was I remember the first time we sat down to read this episode, I was seriously emotionally overcome sitting at the table discussing the possibility of separation from this woman who doesn't even exist in real life. And I lost my mind! I can't leave! This is my home! You're not taking me! You don't even have an actress to play the part. But that's what happens when the writing is this good. And when we've all worked together so closely for, at that point, three years, you don't realize how much a part of your sort of character's life, even if someone who we've never seen has become. Well, thank you. I know this was a very difficult call for you to make. Goodbye. She wants a divorce. <laughs> Took me to completely by surprise, because I'd read the script the night before, and I thought, oh, this is nice. And then uh, there's something about sitting around the table with the other actors, with the writers, with your family like that, that it enhances the reality of it. And uh, <laughs> it was a very strange thing. Maris uh, ordered me to get my stuff out of there by sundown, or else she'd turn it over to a church bazaar. <laughs> The more details we got about Maris, the more impossible it became for any human actress to play her because she had such weird reptilian kind of inhuman, nasty, dark, probably one of the people from, I don't know, the Alien movie or uh, the Buffy the Vampire Slayer series. That might have been the direction we would have had to go if we were really going to cast her, but it's probably safer for the world that we just let her be unseen. Kate, what a pleasure. Likewise, I've been listening to the tapes of all your shows. I love what you're doing. Thank you very much. Uh, I like to think of my show as a haven for the tempest tossed and the maelstrom of everyday life. Wow, you really talk that way. Mercedes Rule and I actually had great chemistry on, on screen. Um, I think the process was uh, a little foreign to her because we rewrite every day. And, and you know, an actress that comes from the theater is a little more used to sticking with the text they've got. You could tell that she wasn't always comfortable in the process. She was always a million bucks on stage. I mean, when the cameras were rolling, she was spot on and funny and, and dedicated. I mean, she's a terrific actress. She's one of the best. I have an idea about the source of our antagonism. Good. Do let me hear it. I'm a woman, I'm as smart as you, and I'm your boss. Coincidence is all. <laughs> It was a great storyline, and it sort of held up, and I loved the way we fell apart, but I, I remember one day I was going home from work after it was camera blocking day, and I uh, was sort of late in our process, and as I stood in the middle of a scene, I suddenly realized what was wrong with it, and they had to do a major rewrite, and of course, we were shooting the next day, and I think she was a little dismayed by that one. Uh, I said goodnight to her as she was driving by. She didn't say a word to me. I thought, hmm, maybe I'm in trouble. Well, hi-ho, the Dario. The cheese stands alone. <laughs> the next morning I came in and, and we were talking a little bit. She came up and said, you know, I've, I've been thinking. 
I've decided that if I were a man, I would want to be you. <laughs> to this day, I'm not sure exactly what it means. Doc, Doc, can we hurry this thing up? I got a charity event tonight. She's not much to look at, but what the hell? Dan Butler is, you can say the same thing about him. Uh, Dan and I go way back. We did work together in uh, at the old Globe Theater in San Diego, very long time ago. So our relationship of now almost 30 years is very warm and affectionate and mutually respectful. I think he's a, a fantastic actor. And he certainly grabbed this character, Bulldog, by the balls and sort of <laughs> did it to a fairly well. Hey, beat it. He fears no heights and uh, is always working without a net. It's, it's, it's lovely to watch him work as well. Gil Chesterton, the restaurant critic. Yes. Oh, I just love those wicked things you say when the food is bad. Well, keep bringing these and you won't be disappointed. <laughs> Edward Hibbert is a genuine one of a kind. He's the, the, the real article. He's, he's authentically himself. He's one of the greatest people I've ever known and I think great people and great actors kind of come in the same breath. For those of you who have not yet sampled the punch, here is my capsule review. <laughs> Vile bouquet, unwholesome color, ghastly taste, and a kick that is simply heaven. <laughs> no one can do what he does with a sentence. No one can do what he does with his physicality. He is an extraordinary person and uh, a great addition to the show. I look forward to every time we have him on the show. What do you two want? Nothing. Keep up the good work. <laughs> Fraser Crane has become a terrific adult, I think. And that's, that's something that, you know, hopefully we all arrive at one day. And I, I feel kind of blessed that I've been able to play a character who's come to terms with his dad and with his brother and with himself through his 40s. You know, I've forgotten what a weird little person you are. <laughs> I've gotten by being involved in this show to experience a set of emotions and a set of relationships that I don't have in real life. And that's a kind of amazing gift. Good night, everybody.